He was a B-29 gunner. He was a B-29 pilot. He told me on the way up here that he started aviation at the ripe old age of 13. That he was gassing and washing airplanes at the Akron Municipal Airport at age 13. He went into the armed forces at age 17. He quit high school and decided that he wanted to go in and become a pilot. When they realized that he'd lied about his age, they couldn't give him a commission, and that's why they made him a B-29 gunner. <clears throat> they sent him to Tinian Island, and he was there in 1944. And he will talk more about Tinian Island, believe me. He returned back to Ohio in 1946. He went to the University of Akron and ROTC. He was recalled again for the Korean War, this time because he had gone through ROTC, he was commissioned and became a B-29 pilot. After the Korean War, he flew for several uh, commercial airlines. He flew for Eastern, Capital and then United, and then he started his own um, company, primarily with moving auto goods. And he said that he was at Akron Canton Airport, he was at Akron Municipal Airport, and then I learned today that in the 1950s and 60s, he flew 20 flights a day, a night, so if you were, if your parents were wakened, it's his fault, out of Youngstown every night, flying to GM and other places with auto parts. So he did that. Uh, he didn't want any credit for it, so he named his airline Shawnee Airlines so that nobody could find him. He said at one time he had more than 100 employees and more than 50 airplanes. In his, in his company's possession. Um, he stopped doing that in 1985, and he now consults for a company called ESCO, E-S-S-C-O. You can find them on the web. It is run by his sons and his daughter, and they collect flight manuals. If you've ever wanted a flight manual, you need to come see this man because he has rooms full of it. Flight manuals, that is. <laughs> and, then in, and then in 2007, he decided to go with the, the uh, Cleveland Akron TV <coughs> network and started the um, Ernie Stadbeck show. And you can find it now on YouTube. Uh, and he is assisted to this day and started back in 2007 by his friend uh, Ray Pulliam. Ray is also an Army veteran in intelligence. Ray also is a private pilot and a camera and videographer aficionado. And so Ray does the producing and the directing, and Ernie does the talking. And I just gave you his name. Ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce to you former Lieutenant Ernie Stadbeck. Now you can come up. Well, thank you, Colonel. And I came up here with Colonel and his executive, Linda. And of course, all you military guys of your rank, you've got to have an executive officer. It's your lady, right? right. You guys get honored on Veterans Day, but how about the ladies? They're executives. And uh, I came home one day. I had four boys and a girl. And uh, I was home five times flying. <laughs> five kids, five times. <laughs> so. I came home, I stood outside the door, and I heard the battle going on. And your mother, my wife, yelling at the kids, wait till your father gets home. And, oh, what am I going to say now? Well, she's in charge. So I walk in the house, I thought, well, the best thing, 
because she's your mother and because I'm your father and I, we say so. That's the only thing I could think of. And then, as plus the fact, to impress my four boys, is I was a commander of men in the military. And my wife gave me that beady eyed stare. I said, well, maybe only two people. <laughs> <laughs> she saw right through me right away. <laughs> but uh, with the ladies now, I, I believe uh, Arnold Toynbee, a noted British historian, the guy that wrote uh, Rise and Fall of the Roman Empire, said that when women arrive, civilization begins. Isn't that true? Absolutely. And you can just look back through history and you can see where the good Lord said, we got to do about this situation, something about this situation. He says, uh, so that's when he brought the ladies and the women in. He says, they will bring civilization to those uncouth guys <laughs> with the hairy knuckles <laughs> and they're always looking for a fight somewhere. And so that's how it all began. Now, so you learned a little bit about history. <laughs> so anybody who's read Twenty, I may be wrong on that, but don't tell me till later, okay? <laughs> and uh, we're here, I'm here, Jim Ray's here, and we're honored to be here, and Dick uh, brought us over, and we had laughs, a lot of laughs coming over. <laughs> Especially Dick telling about his time in, <laughs> as a commander committing all of the Air Force <laughs> maintenance activities, but it was great. I hope we have the same or more better stories going, but they, I don't think he can top them. But I'm going to try to pump him and then steal a lot of his stories, be, pull on the program. But let's back up a minute. I'm here with Ray and for the Mahoning Shenango Valley Military Officers Association. Have I got all that right? Yeah, right. I was worried about that. <laughs> well, come to think of it, I'm supposed to be talking about Amelia Earhart, right? Right. I better get with it. <laughs> okay, well, this goes back. Uh, I'll start off with the airplanes. Okay, I have a connection with Amelia Earhart. And not what you guys think. Okay? <laughs> I only took her out one time, but she's too young. She's too young for me. <laughs> well, anyway, my connection is that we both own the same kind of airplane. Mine was a Lockheed Electra 12A. I bought it in 1967. And it was built 1935, called the 1936 model. And it was only about six inches shorter. I don't know why it was six inches shorter, but to uh, Amelia Earhart's airplane. Well, here's a picture of Amelia Earhart's airplane. Now, you can look, and they're, they're similar. Let me get these things out. Okay, there they are. That's her lock. She had a Lockheed 12E, or 10E. Mine was two serial numbers away from hers, so I do have a connection. Then I got interested. Then a fellow by the name of John Gacy came in from Cleveland, and uh, he started making conversation. I said, after I met him, I said, Mr. Gacy, why are you here? He says, well, I'm a detective out of Garfield Heights, and I want to take pictures of your airplane. I said, uh-oh, what have I done now? <laughs> and he said, no. Nah. Then he told me what, he, uh, what, what happened. He said that a Marine was looking at a magazine, a Marine friend of his, that was in the Battle of Saipan. And this Marine said, was reading a magazine, he yelled to his wife, I saw that airplane on Saipan. So he took it to the Cleveland, the old Cleveland press that's now gone. And uh, these guys, John Gasick, this uh, detective, decided to get some people together, four guys, three and he, and they gathered enough money together to make a trip to Saipan and to look for uh, Amelia Hart's airplane. They went to uh, Pan Am. Pan Am refused to take them into Saipan. Because you have to have permission from the Navy to go to Saipan. What's this? And they, they went to a congressman, a senator, 
They could not figure out why. Well, people thought that the reason they did not were denied permission was that they didn't want people snooping around looking for Mule Earhart's airplane. Well, the real reason was the, in 1950, Truman had a appropriation from Congress of $31 million to build the MTTU, which is a Naval Tactical Training Unit in Saipan, you know, up in the highlands of Saipan. They brought in Chinese national soldiers and were training them in subversive activities to go back into China and disrupt the communist government. Well, the Chinese quickly caught on to that. They killed a lot of them. They turned a lot of them. But that went on the prohib prohibition where people were not allowed to go in there unless they're authorized by the Navy. Well, these guys had the senators go, and they finally got a visa to go there for only two weeks. Because what the government was afraid of, that they'd find out about this secret base, and then stories would get out, and then the Chinese find out. Well, the Chinese knew about it by then. In 1967, these guys went there, went to Saipan, <coughs> excuse me, in 1967, for two weeks. <coughs> and they had a different approach to everybody else. Uh, looking, they were convinced and they were really looking for Emilia Earhart's airplane. So they went back there and uh, they got permission for two weeks. So they decided to do a little differently. They, what they did, they got friendly with the Chamorro natives, so the indigenous people of the uh, Islands, the uh, Marianas Islands, Caroline Islands, <coughs> and Marshall Islands. And uh, these people were, have been subjected. Well, first of all, in 1899, for the Spanish American War, the United States got Guam as reparations. Spain sold the Marshall, all those three islands, island chains, to Germany because they needed the money. Well, the Germans held that and they grew sugarcane and the great sugarcane producing area until 1914. The Japanese were in the League of Nations and the Japanese had coveted the islands, the Pacific Islands, for years. In fact, they came up with a Baron Tanaka Memorial, which I'm sure you fellows have heard of the co-Asian prosperity sphere. Well, the Japanese, in 1914, immediately invaded those islands. They took them over, and they said they're just protectorates. So the League of Nations went along with it. They started immediately to fortify the islands. And in the, uh, 1920, the League of Nations gave them a mandate as protectorate, which we had for a while for the islands of Tinian and Saipan. Guam is the United States, been the United States since the turn of the century. Spain deeded that to us rather than give us money. So there you have it. That was the beginning of World War II, believe it or not. Now we're coming up on DC, uh, DC, or, uh, December 7th, Pearl Harbor Day. Now they're going to say Roosevelt provoked the Japanese. Well, Roosevelt, the war, a war with the Japanese was the last thing our military and Roosevelt wanted because we're so unprepared. Plus, the country was in isolation, moved. I remember as a kid, we always had veterans, it was in Armistice Day. We always had veterans coming in talking about the horrors of war. And we were so woefully unprepared that in 1937, when Amelia Earhart went on her trip and was lost, Japan invaded China. We couldn't do anything about it. And they built up this tremendous military force in all those, remember, 1937 was four years away from Pearl Harbor. They didn't all of a sudden build this up that fast. So they fortified all the islands. Guam, uh, not Guam, that still stayed with the United States, but the United States government took pains never to provoke the Japanese because they knew the Japanese were preparing for war. And there's a Marine Lieutenant Colonel named Earl Ellis. And he 
for some reason or other, the Marine Corps set him up as a traitor so he could get in as a traitor to find out what the Japanese were doing. That's how tight their security was. A fishing vessel went in there, prohibited waters, and people were executed. A couple of American women from uh, Saipan went in there on business, and they claimed they were spies, and they were executed. Nobody got into those prohibited areas. And the Japanese uh, controlled the Chamorros. The Chamorros, uh, they liked the Japanese because the Japanese gave them jobs. Which they and they were prosperous, but they said they were very brutal. If you dropped a piece of paper, the Japanese had the authority to kill you or beat you to death. And if they were terrified of the Japanese. Well, now I'm going to get. I'm going to jump around to get things in. So let's get back to the airplane now. Her airplane was specially built from by Lockheed. It built 1935. Mine was built 1935. My airplane gross takeoff weight, loaded, was 8,400 pounds at an 810-mile range. It cruised roughly 200-something. It was a wonderful airplane. I flew it for years and years. Amelia Earhart's 10E was grossed out at set almost 17,000 pounds. Now, all these books you read about the baloney in them, misinformation and the crap, something like 65 books written, or much last count. I had read probably eight of them, and that was it. No more. Only two books really had good information in them. But the reason I got, well, I was a charter pilot. I'd go out and visit my sons in California. I'd haunt the museums. San Diego, go to Oakland, go to Lockheed, go to Freedom of Information. And right away, you, this is ridiculous. Freedom of what freedom of information? There is no information. In the United States, the government never made an official investigation of her disappearance. The Japanese government never made an official investigation. So there's no archives. You get some of the books out of the library, you read, they always refer to a guy who wrote a book before. That was a, nobody was allowed into Saipan. So how could they get all this information? My son and I went there in 1998 on the basis of what this John Gasek said about look what they went there and they looked and they befriended the natives and they gave them money, bought food from them, and even rented in their little shacks rather than go to that single motel on Saipan Island. So they appreciated this, so they would talk. But then they had to leave. So they went back to Cleveland, raised more money, two guys dropped out, two more joined them. They went back again and the restrictions were lifted. Anybody could go there now, they didn't care. Yeah, the Navy uh, closed up NTTU, which was a super secret thing, almost like the Los Alamos project, the nuclear bomb project. So what happens? They went there. And they did, for the, some of the natives led them to this big gun emplacement where these guys went, these uh, two Marines, after the Battle of Saipan when the war with Ireland was secured in 1944, they went on this hill, looked down in the valley. There was this twin engine, twin tailed airplane with no markings on it. And uh, so they claimed, they thought that they, that was Amelia Earhart's airplanes. When they went back again, they found pieces of aluminum there, which they brought back with them. Then they also they got real chummy with the people again. They did the same thing, the people remembered them and they helped them. They said, well, we don't know or we don't want to talk. Number one, the reason they didn't want to talk was they thought the Japanese were coming back again because they'd been subjugated by so many countries. They also thought, if Americans wanted to talk to them, they just wanted evidence, they're going to prosecute them because they work for the Japanese. Now let's get back to the airplane now. Okay, her airplane had a 4,500 mile range. And her, she made, she left Oakland, Lockheed, the heading east to west. There are four people aboard the airplane, not two, right? You all heard there's two people. Neil Earhart, 
and Fred Newton. There were two people, there were four people rather. One was Paul Mance, who was her flight instructor. Now Paul Mance was a guy who flew the, remember the movie, The Flight of the Phoenix? He was the guy that did all the flying on that uh, rattletrap airplane they built. But he got killed when he ran into a sandstorm in Egypt and pissed uh, after the filming was over. And anyway, he was her flight instructor because she had a lot of flying time in a single engine, but very little in multi-engine aircraft. So she, he was on that trip. Also, here's the other surprise. There was a Navy captain, captain of a Navy cruiser, who was rated one of the top maritime navigators in the world and in the United States Navy. He's a Medal of Honor winner of uh, World War I. His name was Captain Harry Manning. Why did the Navy put him on that flight? The other guy was, of course, Fred Newton. And he's been bad wrapped continually in every book about getting lost. Well, here was a man that was the lead navigator for Pan America. He's also a pilot. This man had 18 Pacific Ocean crossings. This man surveyed all of the Asian and across Pacific routes for Pan Am. But he had one problem. He loved John, John Barbicorn. You know what that is. <laughs> Booze. <laughs> and they let him go. Well, all the books say that she lured him away. She didn't lure him away. He didn't have a job. He needed a job. Who paid him? And the theme of this talk would be follow the money. And believe it or not, we had that hammered into us in law school, which I did go to law school also, <laughs> then became a pilot. <laughs> so not wasted education, good education. Follow the money if you want to find out anything. OK, now we're going to jump back again, jump back to the War Department, which is now the Defense Department. The War Department gave $80,000 during the depths of the worst depression this country ever faced. $80,000 to three unidentified individuals who immediately donated the money to the Purdue Aeronautical Association. That's about the only paper trail you ever will find if you go to Freedom of Information. This thing is, becomes a bureaucratic blunder. I don't think any military man, guys of your caliber, you know, on up, Lieutenant Colonel, whatever, or military pilots would just shake their head at what these guys, what these bureaucrats came up with. So getting back to follow the money. Who paid his salary? The trip was supposed to go from east to west. First stop, Honolulu. Four people aboard the airplane. Every, every book you read, two. So that's one thing. It just gets worse as you go along. Who set up all the 21 stops landing in New Guinea? 21 stops to undeveloped countries, and Noonan hit every one right on the nose. And they claim this guy got lost. Everything you read, you'll probably read about it again. Pearl Harbor Day, he probably got lost. <laughs> it's ridiculous. During World War II, we had young guys go on to navigation school in a matter of months. And they navigate B-29s for 3,000-mile round trips out of Tinian Island and Guam and Saipan. This guy's been doing this for years. Then we go back to follow the money. They took off. Well, who set up the logistics? You military guys know what logistics mean, moving a unit from one place to another. And this, they, they had to go through undeveloped countries. Now, with a load of seven takeoff weight of 17,000 pounds, and here is the Lockheed 10 manual, flight manual. <laughs> Here's my flight manual on the Lockheed 12A, kind of beat up because I used it a lot. When I did the numbers on the two, when all the books say that she had 550 horsepower engines, another book would say she had 600 horsepower engines. Mine were 45 or uh, 450 horsepower Pratt Whitney's on each side. And the airplane weighed 8,400 on takeoff. She weighs twice as much. 
only on 600 horsepower per engine? So people didn't know what they're talking about. So going back again, so I'm really jumping around here, but I, I got to try to get everything in. Pratt and Whitney had developed another engine. Our, mine was R985, hers was uh, 1340, they claimed. And then they, uh, Pratt and Whitney came with an R1830, which is a 1200 horsepower engine. Nobody ever said anything about it. That's supposed to be a super secret engine. But why the secrecy? That's what she had on that airplane. That she had twice the weight I had, yet she had just a small increase in horsepower. They wouldn't even look at Look at the curves here. It never get off the ground. <laughs> the longer you get into it, the more you just shake your head. You know, all the baloney and misinformation just from looking at the technical set. Her, she carried 1,151 gallons of gas in that airplane. You know what that comes out to? 6,906 pounds. Her takeoff weight once again, it's almost 17,000 pounds. She, they left on May 20th, they left Oakland, Lockheed. And they flew to Honolulu their first stop. What happens? They made a bad landing. Well, Amelia Earhart blamed it on Mance, and Mance blamed it on Amelia Earhart. So he flew the airplane over to Wheeler Field because to get a longer runway for such a gas load. <clears throat> then the next day they took off all four people in that airplane. And they said she, one book says she blew a tire. And it's ridiculous. I blew a tire landing my Lockheed at Akron. The airplane didn't even know it. How much does it go down? About that far, right? Just up to the rim. So the wing is still up here. But there's a picture right here of the damage to her airplane. Almost totaled the airplane. The Navy yanked Captain Manning off of the flight. Mance quit, said he's <laughs> meeting his fiance. <laughs> and the Navy's uh, said that, well, his leave was up. Well, how could his leave be up? How could he even be on leave? Because to go around the world in those days would take 40 days. <laughs> so once again, misinformation. You, just, you keep shaking your head. And it just, it's almost beyond belief that PAP, they sent out to people, people still believe by reading another guy's book. The latest one was, excuse me ladies on this one, from a British author, it's called a, a cutesy pie title, East with the Wind, the real story of Amelia Earhart. <laughs> there have been about 65 real stories of Amelia Earhart, but nobody ever had the airplane manuals to figure out. It just couldn't happen the way this impossible. So I'm sure a lot of military people and uh, airline people, long distance people, would just bite their tongues. They couldn't say anything. Who, who provided the gasoline at 21 stops? Who provided the money for that? Who provided the logistics? Who provided the permission through some of these countries? One Arab country refused permission. This went on and on and on. Once again, followed a tremendous amount of money to do all this. Where, where did it come from in the depths of the depression? Then what happened, the government also posted the Coast Guard cutter Atasca from San Diego all the way to Holland Island to act as a radio receiving station. And of course, her airplane had all the latest everything in it, which now would be crude and uh, be really bad flying with that stuff. Ho a DF homing device, direction finding homing device. Ours was ADF, automatic. But direction finding devices, if you knew the frequency, you could dial in, even a standard broadcast station. If you listen to the guy give the call letters, you could go in there, you did Morse code or whatever, and the needle would swing over. Well, she never even went on the frequency. So I'm jumping around again during the flight. She never went to the frequency. She turned down having a trailing antenna installed in the airplane. Trailing antenna meant tremendous range. 
crank it out, crank it back in again. Uh, there are so many things they blame poor Newton for <laughs> getting lost. Once again, you follow the money. And just, I approached the thing as a guy who's had little experience over water and long distance flying. This, this could not be. All these explanations, you can't find out anything. You go to the uh, Navy Bureau, Washington, headquarters. No, that's a civilian operation. We don't ever keep anything. <laughs> a civilian operation. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, if you get up in the morning in the Navy, they, they know it, you know, from the military. So, then when I went there, because I was a charter pilot, I'd go to different cities, look at newspapers, especially in the West Coast, on the old newspapers and the stories. And it just, everything just seems jumbled up. It just, then you try to find out officially through freedom of information. There's nothing there. Until she was lost, then there's a lot of stuff after that. Once again, you follow the money. When she left New Guinea, it was a 3,000 foot runway. If she had those other engines, all the books say, she'd, she'd be in the ocean. Right away, she'd never make it. Plus these guys from Cleveland were wrong about the airplane because they never identified the color on top of the wings. So the Japanese somehow had gotten hold of an airplane built back years ago, Lockheed, because it looked like her airplane. Well, no, they both look alike. They're used as airliners all over the world. But it did not have the black and orange stripes on the top of the wing. That's the hooker right there. That, they painted the airplane like that because if it went down in the ocean, a silver airplane would never be seen. But with those identifying marks on the top of the wings, they could spot it easily. <laughs> I just shake my head when we even started talking about this stuff. Then, let's, uh, the, I saw the uh, filming of her takeoff from Lion New Guinea, uh, New, from New Guinea, for Halloween Island. Holland Island is 2,556 miles from New Guinea. She had a 4,500 mile range, according to Lockheed's figures, which was even more than that because of the amount of fuel she had, 10 tanks in the, in the airplane. 1,151 gallons of gas at 150 miles an hour, do the math. Yet she claimed she's going from here to here. Now, once again, who follow, follow the money? Holland Island is a deserted island. Who, why did the United States government build two landing strips on an uninhabited island during the depths of the depression? Who put mechanics at every stop they had to have something done to the airplane? In one stop, they, for two weeks, they had to change the engines. Who provided that? that you know, things are pretty, uh, not developed in the airplane business then. And in some of these foreign countries, things were not developed. So who did all this? I'll let you come with the answer on that. Who had the money? This was in the depths of the depression. Also, another thing, why did the United States government station three destroyers along her route as radio reporting points? Yet she never Every step of the way, every stop they made, she made the reports. And Noonan hit every one of them. All the way from California, New Orleans, Miami, uh, down to South America, over to Dakar. And then from then on, up through uh, Burma, the rest down into China, down into uh, New Guinea. He hit everything on the nose. They said he, it was a bad takeoff. and. She damaged the airplane again, but got in the air. It's ridiculous. I watched the, vi the film. She took off, and the runway, 25 below the runway is a sea. So she just flew off. She held it down, which is good airmanship, until she had plenty of speed, lifted it off, and flew off the edge. 
She sank out of sight, then slowly raised up again. Same thing happened on our B-29s on Tinian Island. Tinian Island had 200-foot cliffs. <laughs> you watch a 29 take off, you go like this. <laughs> the guy would fly off, and the airplane would sink. Some airplanes, propellers even hit the water, and they'd go for 100 miles before they could climb up, because all the weight you had to carry. Before they captured Iwo Jima, it was a 3,000-mile round trip. Well, we lost airplanes, most airplanes running out of gas. You can always tell when the guy's coming in, from the runway, he's like this, keeping the gas in front of the tank. <laughs> and we had one guy, a Captain Powers, came in, he had the same maneuver, but he's too fast. Overshot the runway with four engines dead, made a 180 degree turn and landed on the opposite runway. They said it could not be done. He did it. He did it the next mission, too. We had terrible engines aboard the B-29. That was really one of the causes of accidents also. Outside all the problems with the Japanese. Now, now I'm jumping around. I'm going to jump back again to Villiero. <laughs> so they, she did make it off of uh, Holland Island, supposedly heading, I say supposedly, heading toward, uh, from New Guinea to Holland Island, 2,556 miles. Now, why did they change? Well, the airplane was wrecked. I'll get back to her again. She, they wrecked the airplane in Honolulu. They had to take it apart, ship it back to the United States. To Lockheed rebuilt the airplane. It cost, they had estimated 30,000. But looking at, right, there's a picture of it. Looking at that picture, it's got to be probably 40,000. This dirty, who paid for that? They got the airplane going again. In the meantime, Billy Earhart and Noonan were in a hotel. Who paid for their expenses? It wasn't cheap, I'm sure of that. She also, now this is a paper trail again. It was documented because it was a hotel. She stayed in the hotel and Noonan stayed in the hotel. They had a stream of military visitors. Then, when the airplane was finished, they all of a sudden announced well, because of the weather problem, we're going to go the other way. <laughs> so they changed the routing. She's supposed to go east-west, which was the shortest way over land. There's some ocean to go over, but not like in the South Pacific. But if you look at the map here, right here, there's a map of uh, Saipan, 1944. Her route from New Guinea to Howland Island would take us to real close to the Marshall Islands. And the Marshall Islands were one of the most fortified places in the South Pacific. The Caroline Islands were fortified. The Japanese fortified every island up there. Saipan, Tanapag Harbor became the largest Japanese naval base in that part of the Pacific. It was also the center of Japanese intelligence. So why was she changed from heading east to change to heading west? And at Honolulu, then everything, then she continued the flight. Manson pulled off. The navigator, he pulled, the Navy pulled him off the trip. But then who paid for all this stuff, all the expenses on this during the depths of the Depression? Then when you draw the line, from New Guinea to Holland Island. It's north, northeast. She made every reports on every stop until she left New Guinea. Why didn't she make any radio reports? And even the commander, you can read the transcript of the uh, radio communications from the Itasca commander and radio people. And then, then she started calling out Mayday. She's low on gas. And they said a garbled message, she's going to Saipan. Some people say, oh, no, that's just garbled. Well, other people say, yeah, it was a, she'd gone to Saipan. Well, she never intended to go to Howland Island. She intended to go to Saipan, the largest naval base. And ladies and gentlemen, remember, 1937 is four years from Pearl Harbor. Much of the, uh, the attack was organized and set up 
out of Tanapag Harbor, which is in the northwest corner of uh, Saipan Island. My son and I went and walked that beach. And you could land the 707 on the hard sand, and that's where the big Japanese flavor picks. So if she's out of gas and she's calling Mayday, that leads you to believe something. Why was she doing that? Because she's heading to Saipan to see what was going on in Saipan. <coughs> Excuse me. The United States would never send anybody in there because Colonel Ellis well, was sent there as a traitor. What happened to him? The Japanese poisoned him. And that came from the, Ch uh, the Chamorro Indians. He was in a restaurant eating, posing as a traitor. Colonel, I think it was Earl Ellis, Lieutenant Colonel of the Marine Corps. <coughs> said the minute he slumped over, the Japanese soldiers out said, guy's body cremated. Yet go to Camp Lejeune. They've got a building there called Colonel Ellis Build In Memoriam. So they knew what happened. So she starts out. She never intended to go to Saipan. She turned north, and she had direction finding equipment, the least state of the art. And then they said she never even turned that on. So then you start seeing bungling comes up in your head that some bureaucrat thought that the United States and the Japanese would honor the international protocol of May Day and help her out. So if she is low on gas, look at that map. She went right by as Lito Airfield, the largest Japanese seaplane and fighter base in the South Central Pacific. She went right by that airport. She was on May Day, and why didn't she land there? There are also some emergency landing fields all the way up to the northwest corner, up to Tanapag Harbor. Why didn't she stop there? And then on top of that, something like three to 400 Chamorros worked for the Japanese in and around the big naval base, Tanapag Naval Base. And they saw the silver airplane land on the beach. They saw two tall people get out, a man and a woman. And the reason the Chamorro natives were so, they were flabbergasted. A woman dressing like a man, they've never seen that. Plus, a woman flying an airplane. They, that's just incomprehensible to them. Plus, a tall woman. All the Chamorros were, were like me. I could probably whip most of them, though, you know. <laughs> Being bigger, maybe a half inch bigger. But so anyway, so many witnesses saw that airplane land there. Two people got out, tall woman, tall man. And uh, what happens? They said to the commander, she said, I'm Amelia Earhart. She said, we know who you are. You're Amelia Earhart, we know who you are. She, they immediately put him into prison. She went to the Garapan jail, which was a squalid place. She got dysentery, she was sick. Knew that they put him into a separate prison. My son and I went there. Ray, what, how much time do I have? Wrap it up. Yeah. Another five minutes. Yeah, the, the good part is coming. I'm sorry I digress because <laughs> I'll make this real quick on the ending. During the Battle of Saipan, the airplane was found in a hangar. It had the right stripes on the wings. The Marines were guarding this hangar, and this uh, sergeant, staff sergeant, uh, J uh, James E. Devine, he said, he, what, What's going on there? And the Marine guards there said, well, we can't tell you, but I'll give you a look. He said, he saw this airplane, and the end number was NR16020. That was Amelia Hart's end number on the airplane. And he said he saw the stripes on the wing. The Japanese had that airplane in a hangar. And the Marine says, look, don't ever tell anybody I told you this. A couple Marine colonels come up, and they demanded to be let in to see what's in that hangar. And a civilian came up in a jeep. He's wearing, what impressed these people was that he was wearing military fatigues and a white shirt, no rank. They wondered who that guy was. He ordered these colonels away. Turned out to be James N. Forrestal, Secretary of the Navy. Uh-huh, plot thickens, right? This is during the Battle of Saipan. 
And these guys, this, uh, Sergeant Devaney, after he and his buddy left the military for years, they were putting, taking out ads in Leatherneck magazine, military magazines for any Marine who guarded that hangar. Rightly, 25 Marines sent him the identical, identical description of what happened. That night, now I'm going to go to the White House, okay? <laughs> Truman and Vice President Henry Wallace were in with FDR. And there was a, a intern, a young fellow by the name of David F. Nobody ever gave his last name because the CIA had pulled him in <laughs> to Langley years later. And I'll tell you why. He said he was an intern. He took coffee and donuts in, and he heard the secretary says, Mr. President, Secretary Forrestal on the line. He picked, uh, Roosevelt picked the phone up and yelled, what? And these other guys got startled, the vice president and Truman. He said, well, what, what, what? He says, they found the bees airplane. Now, I won't use the word in front of ladies. They found the bees airplane on Saipan. This is from the President of the United States. There's witnesses on that. And you know one of the witnesses? General Lucius D. Clay, General of the Armies, right? The other one was Admiral Nimitz. They told one guy who got in the audience with them, Lucius D. Clay said, I have nothing, I had nothing to do with Amelia Earhart, but he said, I hope the truth comes out about that. Admiral Nimitz is one guy, a guy by the name of Fred Gerger, he wrote a couple books, he was very good. He did a lot of investigation, went back to that area five times in six years. But he was abrasive, so he turned the natives off. He put the microphone in front of them or asking them questions. They didn't want to cooperate with him, but they cooperated with these guys from Cleveland because they were nice to him. So there you have it. Then when he told Source Forrestal, he startled them all to burn the bees airplane. And Sergeant Devine, he said that over 300 witnesses, military guys, saw this happen. A Marine colonel, lieutenant colonel by the name of Wally Green, got out of a jeep with a couple of gas cans, poured them on the airplane, and they burned the Muley Arts airplane right on the ramp in front of about 300 military personnel. And everybody was, do say a word. You keep your mouth shut. They, one demolition team of Marines went into a, an administration building blew open a safe thinking they're going to get rich with Japanese money and gold. They found their flight case with their name in it, uh, flight plans, turned it over to a higher authority to disappear. Well, that's what happened. And then this Devane devoted his life to it. And I read a lot of the stuff and uh, just, my, I did a tremendous amount of research. Now, I'll wind it up by saying that uh, then well, when Green, Captain, uh, Colonel Green came back to States, he be, was on a fast track. He became Commandant of the Marine Corps. When Forrestal came back to the United States, the fellows ever, well, they named an aircraft carrier after him. But now, have your folks ever heard of this? Forrestal was locked up in the 16th floor of the Bethesda Naval Hospital in a psychiatric ward. And they say the last person to visit him was Admiral Kimmel. Remember Admiral Kimmel? You'll read about him on December 7th. He's the Navy commander at Pearl Harbor. And he got busted because of bad judgment. He had all the battleships pulled back into Pearl Harbor. Because <clears throat> they knew about the Japanese attack. But they could not provoke the Japanese in any way because the Japanese were intent on war. <clears throat> and they were bound and determined they're going to exert their influence over the whole South Pacific. <clears throat> so the upshot is that we go ahead and bring them up on Secretary Forrestal. Bring him up on the internet. You'll find out, he'll say, he 
die, committed suicide under mysterious circumstances. <laughs> and the last person to visit him was Admiral Kimmel. And Admiral Kimmel ordered the priest out and the Navy corpsman out of the room. And Admiral Kimmel left, and pretty soon he takes a dive. <clears throat> So you can bring that up real easy on what happened to Secretary Forrestal. But he was the architect of suppressing any news about Japanese architects. They, did, they knew that when the war was over, they're going to need Japan, which happened, <clears throat> against Russia. Our biggest fear was Russia, all communism and Russia. But nobody, so that's the extent of the story. You, you folks draw your own hope. I got to say another thing. This uh, uh, Sergeant Devine had a letter from a guy who says, my brother was the intern at the White House, but do not, if you want to talk with him, you go to a pay phone and you call him. You do not send any mail to him. Don't, don't do that. Talk to him through me. What happens, <coughs> they start communicating. Well, then <laughs> David F. D all of a sudden disappears. He winds up down at Langley. And they said they pulled him in. Two hours they read him his non-disclosure statement. See, even though you made that in 1944, we can still prosecute you. And then, from then on, any correspondence was deceased or not here. And it was open before it was even stamped. Draw your own conclusions, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Thank you very much. And <laughs> God bless the United States of America, and God bless the United States military. Amen. I salute you guys. <laughs>